uh, we are moving from uh, making the death easier to trying and prevent death in patients who have cirrhosis. So, uh, like Kesar said, this is an evolving area of disease modifying therapy in cirrhosis. I think what's novel in it is not the interventions which we do. I think we do them regularly in patients of cirrhosis. What is novel is the new concept uh, related to how applying these day-to-day -day, uh, things which we've been doing in cirrhotics uh, will help in uh, changing the outcomes and changing the natural history. So when we are talking about uh, treatment in cirrhosis, it means uh, trying to change the natural history and looking at the natural history of cirrhosis, a number of stages have been described. Uh, it all starts with the etiology, which over months or years leads to the condition called cirrhosis. Then you have stage one, where there is no varices or ascites. Stage two, when there are varices but no ascites, patient is called uh, as compensated cirrhosis. And then you may have a first decompensating event, and you may either decompensate with ascites without varices or patient may have a variceal bleed when it is called stage four and finally stage five when patients may have inflammation or varices. and uh, in addition nowadays some people even describe a stage six of acute and chronic liver failure and all these may get complicated depending on the etiology with hepatocytosinoma so we all know that it is a very complex uh, pathophysiological mechanism involved in patients who progress from early stages to late stages. Uh, upstream is the uh, etiology where uh, you treat the etiology and you are able to improve survival. Kesar talked about antivirals, steroids for AIH, abstinence for alcoholic cirrhosis. Then you may have downstream initial core events following the initial stages of cirrhosis like portal hypertension and bacterial translocation, which may drive the process further. And if you are able to target and reverse these, you may improve survival. Subsequently, more downstream, you may have, when the patients are fully decompensated, you may have inflammation, circulatory dysfunction, oxidant stress, immune dysfunction, which further worsens these patients and Somewhere here are stages five and six when patients develop sepsis or repeated episodes of sepsis or develops the syndrome of acute and chronic liver failure. So let's try and see whether we can target these and prevent deterioration in the liver function and therefore improve survival. So first of all, targeting the etiology that is upstream. This appears to be the most effective treatment, but it has to be done early in the course. So I'll just give you a few examples, uh, again, talking about antivirals, because these are the most effective means of reversing the etiology. So just an example of hepatitis B cirrhotic, 69 patients, median uh, intake of entecavir for six years, a repeat biopsy done later showed a significant improvement in fibrosis in almost 90% patient. And just to give you an example, show a representative picture three biopsies done uh, uh, over the course of receiving antecavir, this was baseline showing cirrhosis, a reduction in fibrosis, and at week, week 268, you can see that cirrhosis has almost disappeared. So this is regression of cirrhosis in patients who received long-term antecavir. Similar data with tenofovir, 641 patients over six years of use of tenofovir. And in addition to significant viral suppression, what you did achieve after repeat biopsy, which was done at the end of 250 weeks, almost a third of patient had regression of fibrosis and 50% patient had regression of, uh, uh, regression of cirrhosis and 50% patient had regression of fibrosis. So this was early when the patients did not decompensate. What about patients who do decompensate? Can we bring them back? So we are talking about DAAs for hepatitis C, so this was a Spanish study, 238 HCV cirrhotics on liver transplant waiting list treated with DAAs. Uh, they were decompensated patients with or without HCC and almost one fourth of them could be delisted from the transplant list. 
And yes, what is important again, even in decompensated cirrhotics, is at which stage you start treatment. So there are different studies. Some give a cutoff of 16 of mild, some 18, some talk of 20. So patients who have lower mild but are decompensated and given DA, you may be able to pull them back. Patients who have a mild of more than 18 or 20, even with the etiological treatment, you may not be able to pull them back. Again, the mantra is to treat early. The second thing, downstream of etiology, the initial core events, one of them is portal hypertension. And treating portal hypertension also controls bacterial translocation. Uh, this is the example of beta blockers. There have been a number of retrospective studies. This was one prospective study of 400 hospitalized cirrhotics, 140 developed bacterial infections. And when they look at the factors associated with it, uh, patients who were advanced cirrhotics, patients who were PP, uh, using proton pump inhibitors were highly likely to develop bacterial infections. And the use of beta blockers was found to be protective. So proportion who develop bacterial infections were significantly lower in beta blocker users than in non-users. And there was a re uh, reduction in infection related morbidity as well as mortality. The second core issue is uh, bacterial translocation, which leads to progression of a number of uh, events in patients of cirrhosis, which leads to uh, further decompensation. And bacterial translocation leads to inflammation. So just to uh, give you a pictorial representation, uh, these are the uh, uh, part of the gut barrier, uh, which is made of the tight junctions and the bacteria as well as their products are not able to cross it in normal situation. Whenever there is a disruption of uh, this gut barrier, either by bacterial overgrowth, infection, inflammation, portal hypertension, congestion in the gut, the microbial products or bacteria leak into the portal vein. And once they reach the liver, they, uh, the, their lesions are the toll-like receptors type 4 on the uh, liver resident macrophages. And they lead to upregulation and release of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF, alpha, and IL-1, leading to inflammatory cascade, leading to liver injury and further worsening of the, uh, the, uh, the ongoing process of liver dysfunction. So how do we reverse that? One, one option we have is antibiotics, and you're all aware of uh, the role which norfloxacin plays uh, in prevention of SBP. And SBP, as you all know, is one of the manifestation of bacterial translocation. So this was the randomized control trial in uh, high-risk cirrhotics, cirrhotics who were at high risk of developing SBP, advanced uh, CTP score, low protein ascites, low sodium, and patients were randomized to receive norfloxacin and placebo. The probability of SBP was significantly lower in those that received norfloxacin. In addition, it also led to improvement in survival in patients who were receiving norfloxacin uh, as compared to placebo. But the problem with norfloxacin and many other fluoroquinolones or uh, the antibiotics which target gram-negative bacteria uh, is, is the uh, uh, emergence of uh, resistant strains, res uh, emergence of infection due to gram-positive bacteria subsequently. So uh, there was talk of uh, rifaximin, which is a uh, uh, non-absorbable antibiotic. And this particular randomized control trial was a combination of rifampicin uh, and midodrine in patients with refractory ascites, 600 of them randomized to receive either midodrine rifaximin or standard medical therapy for 12 weeks. And as you can see, the control of refractory ascites was uh, significantly better in patients who received midodrine and rifaximin. And not only that, it also led to improvement in survival in the midodrine uh, rifaximin group as compared to the SMT group. But there were a number of problems with this study in terms of methodology and in terms of analysis, and possibly this could not be replicated uh, later. Another way which with, uh, you can uh, target or uh, uh, intervene in terms of changing the bacterial flora and bacterial translocation is by the use of probiotics. And this study was from India, from Dr. Dhiman's group. 130 cirrhotics who had recovered from hepatic encephalopathy were given placebo 
or BSL-3 for six months. And patients who received uh, probiotics had a significantly lower rate or lower incidence of admission to hospital uh, because of hepatic encephalopathy, lower episodes of uh, uh, breakthrough hepatic encephalopathy. And not only that, there was a significant reduction in their CTP and MELD score as compared to placebo at the end of six months, suggesting that they did alter the course or natural history of these patients who had developed hepatic encephalopathy by not only preventing episodes of encephalopathy, but also improving their liver function. <clears throat> so targeting bacterial infection, what I talked about are the interventions which we regularly use in these patients. Let's talk about some novel things which we have not been using up till now. One of them is Farnesoid X receptor. You heard a lot about this because this the drug uh, called obetifolic acid has recently been uh, introduced in the market uh, and has got clearance for use in uh, PBC. So uh, it was shown in uh, uh, experimental models that the gut integrity was uh, maintained by FXR and it was disrupted by presence of interferon gamma and natural killer cells. And it was shown that upregulation of FXR led to this uh, uh, improvement in gut integrity, which was being driven by interferon gamma and natural killer cells. Uh, and the FXR agonist obeticolic acid was able to do this job, at least in experimental models. And once we have data in humans, probably we'll be able to use this for this particular purpose. Talking about low molecular weight heparin, in the previous uh, webinar of FILD, probably you would have heard about this, of prevention of portal vein thrombosis in patients with sepsis. So this was the study of 70 cirrhotics who were decompensated, given uh, 48 weeks of enoxaparin daily versus placebo. And as you can see, that probability of portal vein thrombosis was significantly lower in the enoxaparin group, so much so that enoxaparin was stopped at week 48, but even at week 96, none of the patients who had received enoxaparin developed portal vein thrombosis, whereas almost a third in the placebo group developed portal vein thrombosis. And not only that, the probability of decompensation was also significantly lower in the enoxaparin group, and the probability of survival was significantly better in the enoxaparin group. So you must be wondering uh, why I'm talking of enoxaparin and reduction in bacterial translocation because it was also seen that there was a reduction in markers of intestinal injury as well as systemic inflammation in the group that received enoxaparin, possibly related to uh, uh, reduction or reduced incidence of microthrombi in the intestinal blood vessels and therefore leading to reduction in uh, congestion and reduction in bacterial translocation. Another uh, novel concept is the use of statins in patients of uh, cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis to prevent multitude of uh, uh, endpoints. Statins, in addition to uh, protecting the endothelial, endothelial integrity, also have an effect on inflammation, platelet aggregation, oxidative stress, and have immunomodulatory action. So this was the initial study which talked about it, 158 cirrhotics with uh, portal hypertension on beta blockers and uh, EVL for secondary prophylaxis. So statins was given in these patients to prevent rebleed. So they thought that uh, statins could reduce portal hypertension. So gave, they gave somat, uh, simvastatin 20 milligram per day for 15 days and then 40 milligram per day versus placebo for two years. But they could not demonstrate a reduction in rebleed. But surprisingly enough, what they were able to demonstrate that patients who received simvastatin had a significantly lower mortality as compared to those who received placebo. And subsequently, there were a number of population-based study like this uh, veteran study uh, in more than 9,000 HCV infected patients of which 1,600 developed cirrhosis. And they demonstrated that there was a dose response relationship uh, between non-users and highest dose users of statins that patients who did receive statin and higher dose of statin had a lower risk of progression to cirrhosis 
from chronic hepatitis C and the types of statins also mattered. Uh, the statins which are lipophilic, for example, atorvastatin and fluvastatin uh, were the most effective. And not only that, they also led to a dose dependent reduction in decompensation. And now there are studies suggesting that they also reduce the incidence of liver cancer. So coming to albumin, we have been using albumin regularly in patients of cirrhotics. These are the standard indications of use, uh, prevention of post uh, uh, paracentesis circulatory dysfunction in patients with SBP and in patients of HRS, but there are many non-oncotic properties of albumin also. It's anti-inflammatory effect, it's antioxidant effect, the maintenance of endothelial function, uh, binding of toxins such as PAMPs and DAMPs. So this was a study of long-term albumin infusion. They call the ANSWER trial 431 cirrhotics with uncomplicated ascites given 40 milligram, 40, sorry, 40 gram of albumin twice a week for two weeks, followed by 40 gram once a week for 18 months. And they demonstrated significantly better survival in the patients who were given uh, albumin infusions long term versus the standard medical therapy. And not only that, there was a significantly lower incidence of SBP, non-SBP bacterial infections, hepatic encephalopathy, and HRS type 1. All the complications which are associated with inflammation and oxidative stress, suggesting that possibly albumin had an effect on these two. So it doesn't stop here. We've been using vitamin E regularly in patients with uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So yes, this was a retrospective study of long-term vitamin E use in patients with NASH, 800 units per day versus placebo, and median almost 5.6 years of use. Almost 75% patients were cirrhotics and almost two thirds were diabetics. And they demonstrated that those who were given vitamin E had a significant lower risk of developing hepatic decompensation. Not only that, it also improved the transplant-free survival. This is the curve for controls. The transplant-free survival was significantly better with vitamin E. And not only that, there was a significantly lower all-cause mortality. So not, it, it not only is affecting NASH, but also some other uh, problem or other pathophysiology in patients who have NASH-related cirrhosis and the number needed to treat was 4.2. So this is the often forgotten problem in patients with uh, cirro uh, cirrhosis and we generally ignore it. We are all guilty of it and we know that it impacts survival. Patients who have more advanced malnutrition and they are cirrhotics have higher mortality as compared to those who are well-nourished. And sarcopenia is uh, one of the manifestation of uh, uh, malnutrition. And we have amongst us uh, Punita, who has worked extensively and published extens extensively on this issue. And this particular study from her, 142 cirrhotics on liver transplant waiting list. And she demonstrated that patients who were sarcopenic had a survival or mortality, which was as bad as patients who were high milders. So sarcopenia, a manifestation of malnutrition, is independently associated with poor survival. So can we reverse sarcopenia and therefore improve survival? And this was possibly the only study which talked about it. There are a number of targets which can be, uh, uh, I mean, acted upon to improve sarcopenia. This was one of them, 57 cirrhotics who received tips and 32 without tips, median follow-up of 13 months, and patients who did receive tips, uh, their sarcopenia improved uh, at the end of follow-up period. And those who had an improvement in sarcopenia had a better survival than those who uh, remained stable or had a reduction in the muscle mass, suggesting that nutrition per se and nutrition as manifested by sarcopenia, if acted upon, also can help an improvement in survival. And there's nothing new in this nutritional therapy. You have to overdrive uh, uh, the catabolic state by high protein, high calorie diet, frequent snacking, six to seven small meals per day, which includes a late evening and early morning snack. 
and these are the tar uh, targets uh, some novel therapies for treating sarcopenia and as you can see at least two of them portal hypertension and inflammation i've already covered uh, in the previous section suggesting that they have a major impact on survival as well as nutrition so i'll i'll sum up here and the take home messages are that there are several opportunities in the natural history of cirrhosis to either halt or slow, slow down the progression and therefore improve survival targeting upstream basically at the etiology is the most effective way but it has to be done early even in decompensated patients it has to be done at an early stage to be able to effective to pull back these patients from the stage of or the point of no return downstream targeting possibly has to be at multiple levels not at one level and based on the mechanisms which drive portal hypertension circulatory dysfunction bacterial translocation inflammation and oxidative stress and the intervention which you can use obviously you have to start with nutritional therapy beta blockers statins non absorbable antibiotics now we have midodrine vitamin e and possibly uh, once we have more data on regular use of albumin low molecular weight heparin and growth factors so the question i was asked was whether there is hope or it is only a hype so the data which i have uh, presented to you is quite compelling and based on robust studies which suggest that if we apply these interventions in these patients possibly we might be able to uh, reverse uh, Uh, if not reverse at least slow down the progression and improve survival and the key is applying these interventions at the right time and right stages so there is definitely hope thank you thank you dr kaushal that was a very crisp uh, lecture especially you highlighted the various uh, you know levels at which we could intervene etiology during management and at the you know the 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 role of nutrition and all i have uh, two questions one is that the, the role of statins has been there in many studies since more than like 15 years i would say but still it has not come into kind of mainstream uh, hepatology guidelines now what is the issue with that and secondly is it something to do with etiology they have been studied in hepatitis c and statins is it across etiologies and and the other thing is that how do you dose statin you said there is a dose response kind of relationship we know in cirrhotics there their cholesterol levels are really low i do start statin in all patients but sometimes i get an ldl value of like 25 or 30 i feel scared because even low ldl has got some some morbid effects on the on the in the cardiovascular system so how do you dose a statin you know uh, in these situations so i i i think that's a very important issue you've raised uh, early in the course when these patients are compensated i think you can uh, safely start with the the standard doses uh whereas patients who are decompensated their clearance also gets reduced and their levels may rise and they may lead to rhabdomyolysis so there you may have to start with a lower dose possibly the dose which has been recommended for cardiovascular use the lower range of that spectrum would be uh, i think what is advisable yeah how about the etiology do you have come across studies in which statin of use across etiologies yeah so they have used it in hepatitis c hepatitis b and alcohol related cirrhosis and across the board they have shown similar results so it is not related per se to the etiology because earlier people used to say that hepatitis c may also be associated with uh, metabolic syndrome especially genotype 3 cirrhotics but it has been uh, this beneficial effect has been seen in hepatitis b and alcoholic cirrhotics as well wonderful uh does any other panelist have any question yeah kaushal can you hear me am i audible kaushal yeah shall i so uh, just one question you talked about the use of albumin over long term that is weekly dosing my question is that if the patient has a baseline or on regular uh, lfts the albumin values are like 3.5 or above 3.5 like many patients i have seen they have ascites but their albumin levels are good despite no albumin therapy so do these patients also benefit from this long term albumin infusion therapy uh possibly not and in these patient uh, only the, the triggers for use of uh, uh, albumin would be those standard uh, indications which i just mentioned 
I mean, even in this particular study, I think there were uh, multiple issues uh, with the methodology. For example, they included patients who had early cirrhosis and uncomplicated ascites. These are the group of patients where we hardly use albumin. Yeah, I'm talking about this group only. Exactly. So, yeah. Possibly in this group, we would, in our practice, the way we practice, we wouldn't be using albumin. So I agree that we need to have data in patients who have uh, advanced cirrhosis, who have difficult to treat ascites, refractory ascites, what happens in this group. So there was a study in patients who were on transplant waiting list and advanced cirrhosis. In that, they did not show improvement in survival, but they used lower doses of albumin, say uh, once in two weeks. And that study, unfortunately, was published as an abstract form only in 2017, has not been published in a, uh, in a uh, full paper. So I don't know, we need to have more data on that. And uh, just an addendum to that question, uh, you talked about low molecular weight heparin also. So in that particular study, were there any side effects like in terms of increased incidence of CVAs because many of these patients are NASH elderly patients. So was there an increase of intracranial bleeds in long-term low molecular weight heparin therapy? So uh, bleeding complications were similar in the two groups and uh, it was not significantly higher. And the dose they used was uh, the prophylactic use, uh, dose of once a day dosing rather than twice. And I think we have been using that Otherwise, also in patients who are bedridden cirrhotics to prevent their uh, uh, DVTs. So I think that is not a very high dose and can be safely used. But yes, I would still be worried about patients who have high risk varices. Even if I want to use uh, this kind of therapy, I would first eradicate the varices by EBL and then uh, probably use. But if you ask me in my practice, I have not been using it. Thank you. I think uh, these are very interesting topics and carry on the discussion. Just one last question. I, I, I hope Charles can give us like 30 seconds. Uh, Shali, uh, uh, sorry, Koshal, Koshal, have you come across a paper regarding the use of growth hormone for, for, for improving the nutrition and cirrhotics? Long time back, I remember seeing a paper from China in which they showed dramatic results in improvement in nutrition. After all, it's an anabolic hormone. And in, in oncology nowadays, they are, they're using a lot of growth hormone to build up nutrition of patients after successful, uh, you know, uh, chemotherapy or oncotherapy? Yeah. So I think there are studies of, uh, th th in fact, there was a study from Chandigarh, I think, uh, which was presented last year in ASLD from Dr. Brinder Singh's group, where they combined GCSF and growth hormone in patients of cirrhosis. And they showed that there was improvement in survival. But again, there were small number of patients uh, and probably we need more data on that. So that was growth hormone. But uh, what I can say is the use of testosterone. Testosterone has been tried in patients who have uh, sarcopenia and uh, hypogonadism. And it has been found to improve at least their bone mass and muscle mass.